respond to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And can I inform members that questions 7 and 13 have been withdrawn? And I call Ms Michaela Boyle. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, whilst I meet with the local banks regularly, the focus of these discussions is on current levels of lending to small and medium-sized enterprises and on restructuring to ensure that local areas continue to have adequate access to financial services. Whilst I would be happy to raise with the banks any concerns or evidence in respect of customers in Northern Ireland being unfairly subject to higher bank charges, at the current time I am not aware that this is a major issue. In addition, differences in banking charges are a consumer issue, which perhaps the Deddy Minister uh, might be in a better position to take forward. It is, of course, a matter for the Irish Government to represent the interests of banking customers resident in the Republic of Ireland, although this should not be to the detriment of Northern Ireland customers. Thank you. And I call Ms Boyle for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his response? Um, given that local banks, Minister, and I was hearing what you were saying, have higher standard and non standard bank charges uh, than the exact same banks operating in the South and indeed some of the British banks, would the Minister agree with me that it is not appropriate that, uh, and should be addressed and that this issue should be addressed uh, promptly? As I said in my response to Deputy Speaker, I am not aware of it being a major issue. If the member is um, in receipt of, of different evidence, I am happy to take a look at it. In fact, I am very content if the member wishes to furnish me with any information that she has in respect of differences or, or perceived discrepancies between uh, banking charges on this side of the uh, Irish border versus the other, um, particularly within uh, the same bank. Bearing in mind, of course, that uh, whilst the, it may be Part of the same group, they are different companies and they are operating in different currencies, and there are uh, uh, perhaps a range of, of, uh, of uh, explanations as to why it may be the case. But as of yet, I haven't, been, I haven't received a, a wealth of correspondence from anyone suggesting that it is a problem. But if the member is uh, differently informed, I'd be happy to, to take receipt of that information and, and take it up with the banks in the regular meetings that I would have with them. And I call Lord Morrow for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what progress has the Access to Finance Implementation Panel made to date? Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for, for, for his question. Uh, and the House will recall that the Access to Finance Implementation Panel was uh, something that uh, myself and my uh, counterpart, the Enterprise Minister uh, Arnie Foster, established to take forward the recommendations that were included in, in Minister Foster's uh, Economic Advisory Group report into access to finance, uh, and I, I, have to, I have to say, Deputy Speaker, I think we have been uh, very well served by the members on that uh, panel, uh, who are Russell Griggs, who heads up the appeals mechanism for the British Bankers Association, John Trithowen, uh, who is uh, head of the Irish Credit Review Office, uh, Anne McGregor, who will be familiar to many in the House, is the um, uh, Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce, uh, and their experience directly with banks and directly with local businesses has been invaluable to uh, Minister Foster and I in respect of uh, improving access to finance. Uh, we took receipt of their report with the recommendations, which covered four broad areas, Deputy Speaker, including um, looking at the structure of our banking sector in Northern Ireland, which are recognised as being different uh, and unique to this part of the United Kingdom, the issue of property overhang, which uh, the member in the House will be familiar with as a particular problem in Northern Ireland. They have also looked at the issue of the ed education uh, needed right across the board on, on our changed circumstances within banking in Northern Ireland. Uh, and also, I think importantly, and something that we can take forward um, uh, quite quickly, is the need for banks and business and government to work much better together and to improve communication between banks and business and government. And, um, the House will be aware of the difficulties that we have had as a House and the committees of this House in engaging with banks in the past. And I think if there is a, an attempt, and I believe there to be a genuine willingness on part of, part of banks to uh, engage better with government, um, then I think we will all be the beneficiaries of that. Um, those recommendations were put to the Joint Ministerial Task Force on, on Banking Issues and Access to Finance Issues, which uh, were the Secretary of State uh, and Treasury and, and Business uh, Ministers from Whitehall were present as well. Uh, and there's many parts of those recommendations which they can take on board as well. But I have to say that I put on record my thanks to the, the members of the panel for the work that they have done to date. Kelly. Deputy Speaker, uh, 
I, I know the Minister yeah, said there's an, an overlap with Deti, but I just wondered, Minister, in relation to any discussions you've had with banks and, and small businesses in relation to procurement uh, with the public sector, whether there were any recommendations that could be followed up and or have been actioned, and further, if there has been any threat of closure uh, on some of the small businesses uh, from the banks. It's a fairly wide-ranging question. I think about that. I've, I've, uh the member has successfully inserted the issue of, of procurement uh, and small and medium-sized enterprises into uh, a topic, a uh, question about banking. Um, and um, I know that it is an area that I receive a lot of correspondence, and not least from the, uh, the member and, and, and others, uh, about from time to time. Um, and, and I appreciate that, in respect of procurement, um, it is impossible probably to satisfy everybody in regard to, to procurement. There are always winners. And there are always losers, given the nature of the contest that, that goes on for public sector tenders, which are sizable. I mean, we are, we are a large customer in Northern Ireland. About £2.6 billion pounds each year is spent by government on public procurement. Um, I'm, I'm content, though, that we have managed to, insofar as we can, strike a balance between... And there's always scope for improvement, always willing to listen to people who, who would suggest that uh, improvements can be made. Uh, but I think there is a reasonable balance between the issue of value for money and ensuring that local small to medium-sized enterprises get a, a, a fair chunk of the business. 81% of contracts um, in between April and August of, of this year have been awarded to SMEs, with 74% of contracts awarded to Northern Ireland firms. So Northern Ireland firms do, do pretty well in respect of, of um, uh, procurement and government procurement in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, in regards to um, issues with uh, banks and small to medium-sized enterprises, I think that what we are seeing from the the lending data that has now been published as a, work of, as a result of the work that has been put in over the last number of years is that um, there is a, a loosening up in the availability of cash to small to medium-sized enterprises. It isn't quite right yet. This isn't quite uh, where we need it to be, but there is certainly an improvement uh, uh, with a, a sizable increase uh, between quarter one and quarter two of this year and a year-on-year -year increase as well. So there are signs, Mr Deputy Speaker, that there is an improvement in the availability of finance for small to medium-sized enterprises, which is so essential if we are wanting to grow our economy. I call Mr Raymond McCartney. Vertol, let us hold question number two, please. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Northern Ireland Civil Service is generally regarded as an exemplar employer in terms of its flexible working human resource policies. Civil service offers a range of flexible working patterns such as, fle uh, patterns such as flexi time, term and part time working, and job sharing to support staff in the balance between their work commitments and life responsibilities. Whilst there is a guiding and overriding principle that this flexibility should be achieved without adverse effect on the overall efficiency of departments or on service to the public, the aim of these flexible working policies is not primarily to reduce costs. My department provides the technology to support a range of flexible working options. However, decisions to deploy technology to support a more flexible or agile work style are a matter for individual business areas and departments. Call Mr. McCartney for a supplement. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer? Uh, th this morning, I mean, the former finance minister was involved in a very interesting discussion on Radio Ulster, and I think, despite the sort of no different political perspectives, productivity was something which featured, which would be no bad thing for all aspects of the economy. I'm just wondering if there are any other steps which the civil service could take in terms of flexi time to increase productivity, which would be obviously a bonus for all concerned. Yes, I, I, did, I did hear the, the members. Uh contribution on the radio uh, this morning. I think we may, may come on to that in a, in a uh, question number four is probably more relevant to that, so I don't want to say anything about that just, just yet. Um, the, um, I, I, look, I, I think we're, we're all, particularly in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, with less money available um, to the government in Northern Ireland to spend, we are wanting to see increases in productivity, and that can be a challenge to, 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 to do in the, in the circumstances. Um, but we should always be irrespective of the circumstances seeking to increase productivity right across the board. Uh, and I appreciate that um, being a more uh, flexible employer in terms of making uh, new practices, new policies, new technologies available to our staff is important in doing that. And I have to say, I'm, 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 we had a debate on this in the uh, short, but nonetheless uh, useful debate on this subject yesterday uh, in the Assembly. 
uh, and we were able to highlight some of the things that I think, whilst I think there was understandable criticism of some elements of our development of policy by the committee in its report, I think it was an opportunity for me as well to highlight where we have been doing a good job in becoming an exemplar, particularly in the use of, of teleconferencing, and the member will be interested in representing his constituency that uh, on a daily basis, NI direct staff in Belfast and have uh, teleconferencing meetings with their counterparts in Londonderry, which allows staff to work closer to, to home. Um, we also have developed a range of, of uh, business zones or hubs across Northern Ireland, and that's something that I'm keen to take forward with the department um, where opportunities might arise. So we have some in Belfast and Castle Buildings here in the Storm of the State. There's also one in uh, Marlborough House in Craig Avon, one in Academy House in, in Ballymena, which allows staff to plug into the system securely, even though they're not necessarily based in those buildings. And there are other, a range of other measures that we've been able to bring forward. And I think my job is to ensure that the policy is there. Uh, my job is also to ensure that the technology is there, and it's very much up to the departments where and when appropriate to take that forward. And, and I'll not be found wanting in making sure that the policies and the technology is there to allow increased productivity in the way the member suggests. Thank you. And I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. As Concordia, August Gumbuikas, Lishinara, Asokta, Aragrenchen, the Keshtogamir, Fui, Chorus, Ibra, Solupa, San Arnal, Fibli. Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you very much, and I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Um, he, he heard the debate yesterday on flexible working, and one of the points made during that debate wa was in relation to the considerable savings made through flexible working arrangements in Whitehall departments. Would the Minister agree with me that it's much preferable? to mix those savings through the promotion of flexible working arrangements rather than reducing the headcount in the public service? I, 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 don't, I don't actually agree with the, the premise that the, the member is putting forward. Whenever we are facing, as we are in the next financial year, uh, million pounds, over £200 million worth of reductions in public spending, when we are looking at a um, public spending landscape to the end of this decade, where uh, 13 per cent in real terms reduction is what we could be facing in terms of cuts to our spending. That would be equivalent of over a further billion pounds coming out of, of public spending in Northern Ireland. With the best will in the world, the adoption of all of the flexible working practices that you could think of will not bridge that gap. And if you take, for example, the, I mentioned Marlborough House as the business zone there that uh, allows staff to, to work there even if they're not actually based in, in, in Marlborough House and Craig Avon. Uh, the in indicative monthly saving there in terms of travel costs to those staff is £5,300. Now, we would need a lot of savings like that across different places to, to bridge a £200 million spending gap, never mind a £1 billion spending gap. Uh, I think that we can certainly use this to, to help make savings. It isn't the principal objective. The principal objective for me is to ensure that you get that better work-life balance and people are working closer closer to home and fits in around their, their care and other needs that they might have as, as, as ordinary citizens. Um, you will not get significant savings through flexible working if, if, of course, you don't have a commensurate reduction in the footprint of the civil service estate across Northern Ireland. And that is something that we have been aggressively pursuing. Uh, the asset management strategy is seeking to realise and has been realising over £15 million pounds of savings a year as we consolidate the civil service office estate. But with the best will in the world and, and with respect to the, to the member, I don't think adopting flexible working policies are going to see us through a £200 million spending shortfall in Northern Ireland, never mind a £1 billion spending shortfall between now and the end of the decade. Thank you. And I call Ms. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Um, has the Minister assessed if there are any gender differences in the uptake of the current flexible working practices? And if so, are these a barrier to women progressing in the civil service? No, I, ha I haven't um, assessed whether there are any gender uh, differences. I mean, I think, as we were talking about yesterday during the debate, sometimes there's a, there's a, a focus on flexible working being around flexi time, which is available, obviously, to a wide range of civil servants, or about uh, home working and things like that. But it can be about uh, job sharing and other aspects, which I think may, may be, uh, I'm guessing, probably more prevalent amongst female members of staff. But I have no evidence to back that up, but I certainly um, dig that out for the member and provider with it. And, and it may be helpful in revealing if there are issues then around um, take-up 
uh, by particularly female members of staff, and whether that is a barrier then to progression through the civil service, uh, senior civil service, where of course we do have an issue at senior, service, senior civil service grades of attracting more women into those posts. Speaker, the, the executive is facing a 1.6% real terms reduction in its resource Dell in 2015-16. Combined with a number of central and departmental pressures, this means that all departments will be required to deliver significant savings in 2015-16 and beyond. The draft budget, which I announced on 3rd of November, sets out the executive's plans for a balanced budget in 2015-16. The only strategic lever open to the executive to raise significant amounts of additional funding is the regional rate, which contributes approximately £650 million to public services. The executive has agreed that in 2015-16, regional rates will increase by inflation only. I consider it unfair to ask our citizens to pay more in a time when our economy is still recovering. For the most part, the power to generate additional income lays with individual departments rather than the executive as a whole. Although no specific proposals have been included, as part of the draft budget, ministers are encouraged to consider options for increasing revenue where appropriate. Mr. Hutchin for a supplement. Uh, I've got a brief last concord, August, uh, going based on IRA as uh, Could I ask the minister, has he considered any new progressive levies that might uh, broaden the revenue base? I, I'm, I'm tempted, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to put it back to the member and suggest you know, where, where he thinks that, that could, be, could take place. Uh, you know, I think there are. Um, we've, got to be, we've got to be careful. I know the member and his party are, are, are prone to thinking that you know, money grows in trees sometimes. You know? um, that every, whether, whether we even, just by inserting the word progressive in front of something, you know, which almost seems to, seems to suggest that it takes away the pain of having to pay any tax, you know, that people have to pay in some way, or businesses have, have to pay. Now, there are, um, uh, the study has been undertaken by, by my department, which will conclude very soon in terms of additional tax varying powers that we might want to take on as an assembly. So uh, things like, uh, I think some of, those, some of those that might be in a, a more favorable position are things like landfill tax or, or stamp duty. Uh, it's interesting to observe what they're doing in Scotland at the minute, where they are attempting to have a more progressive um, land, stamp duty uh, land tax system put in place, the transactional taxes, I think what they call it. Uh, and I'm open to look at all of those. Um, I don't think they have the same transformative effect on our economy, for example, as um, the likes of uh, corporation tax would have. Um, but they are uh, interesting to look at nonetheless, and if they provide some benefit for Northern Ireland, and of course they're affordable, um, I would be supportive of, of uh, devolving them, particularly if they have a defined social and or economic benefit. Um, but you know, I think we have to bear in mind that you know, our, our ability to raise revenue off a very small tax base is limited. And of course, even if we were, and even if it was progressive, somebody still has to pay for it. And at a time whenever the economy, in my view, whilst, whilst recovering, whilst doing a lot better, uh, whilst improving all the time, I think we've got to be mindful and very careful about increasing the tax take from our citizens at a time whenever many of them are still feeling under, under significant pressure. Mr. Gregory Campbell. Um, it's refreshing to hear the Minister directly answering questions, which is, is refreshing compared to his decal colleague last Monday, who refused to. But could I ask uh, the Minister, could I, could I ask, could I ask the Minister, obviously hit the bullseye again, uh, could, I, could I ask the, the Minister if whenever the discussions and debates are going on, Whenever the discussions and debates and responses are going on in response to the, uh, the draft budget, has he outlined or identified any areas of additional revenue that he may begin to potentially explore beyond that stage? I, I think some have tried to characterise that the, the budget is not uh, raising revenue at all. Uh, it does, of course, include an increase in our, our rates, uh, and the regional rate will go up by the rate of inflation. I think it's the, the right level for it to go up by. I think people understand that, that our costs are rising just as their costs are rising, and I think an inflationary increase is acceptable. I think anything beyond that, and then you're into uh, difficulties and the sort of difficulty, the difficulties that I was outlining to, to Mr. O'Shane in terms of uh, pressures that households are under. So, you know, our, our tax take will, will go up, um, our, our rate take, sorry, will go up because of increasing the regional rate by, by inflation. Um, I think that there is limited scope for other. Um, charges or costs to be implemented. I, I, am, I am happy um, 
content probably is a better word, to look at a range of other measures that might have broader political support. I think it's important that if we start to entertain other ideas that they do have a measure of broad political support and that it can't be just one party or another party just introducing it themselves through their department. So I'm thinking things like rates, for example, rates is, an, is, is what's called an unhypothecated tax where the money comes in and then just goes to a range of services, it doesn't go to particular services. But I would be content and prepared to look at uh, hypothecating revenue from some sources going to particular areas. So I'm thinking primarily of things like pre prescription charges. Uh, and a reintroduction of some level of prescription charges, but so long as it was targeted towards some of those pressures that our colleague, the Health Minister, is facing in terms of, of, of drugs for, for cancer and other serious illnesses. And the same could be said, and I listened with interest to the contributions by the two Vice Chancellors last week, some, something similar could be made an argument around uh, student fees and a small increase uh, in student fees that would go to support the, the higher education sector through some of the difficulties that it's going to have in the next financial year. So I'm happy to explore and look at those things, but I think it needs a, a measure of reality on all parts and a broad support across uh, around the chamber for uh, doing those sorts of things. Thank you. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And if I can um, follow on in the same way to the Minister, has he looked at and discussed with Westminster ways of gearing more money out of the income that we do get either from the Treasury from others so that we can actually make more use of the money we're getting to leave more money from other sources? I think one of, one of the ways in which I think the draft budget um, does not is in terms of the investment fund which we're proposing to be created. So this is the, the use of and Mr Cree is just over his right shoulder there and he's a um, frequent questioner in this House about the use of financial transactions capital. Uh, I think this is an innovative and imaginative way in which we can use that financial transactions capital, which we actually run the risk of, of not being able to spend all of our allocation this year. Uh, and I think that uh, investment fund that I speak about it ticks, a, ticks a box that the member is talking about because that is going to um, put in perhaps around about £100 million of financial transactions over the next capital over the next number of year, years and will levy, leverage in. Um, around a billion pounds of additional investment from, we hope, the European Investment Bank. Um, so there, that is, I think, extracting better value, Deputy Speaker, out of the money that we have, um, we're, that we're receiving from Treasury, and thinking about imaginative and creative ways about exploiting that and getting, in that case, a, a 10, for, 10 to 1 uh, benefit out of it. Thank you. And I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I do not see how the introduction of a living wage would impact on savings or receipts in Northern Ireland. Whilst an analysis of the economic impact of replacing the minimum wage with the living wage has not been conducted by my department, the key issue is that any increased tax receipts would accrue to the Treasury, as would any Social Security benefits savings. Whilst the Northern Ireland Executive might, in theory, benefit from increased revenue in terms of the regional rate, any impact is likely to, likely to be marginal at best. It is also important to recognise that the living wage for Northern Ireland may be lower than in the rest of the United Kingdom, reflecting the lower house prices and the support the executive is currently providing by holding rates low and not introducing water charges. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, and I hear what the Minister has said, but would he not agree with me that increasing wages would actually boost the economy and lift a lot of our people out of poverty? And would he commit to carrying out a full and detailed analysis of the potential impact of uh, the living wage on the local economy? Yeah. The member and I will not disagree that increased wages are a good thing. Uh, in fact, that was the, the essence of the uh, previous minister's contribution on the radio this morning, that what we want to see in our economy is increasing wages, and that's precisely what the economic strategy which has been agreed by the executive is all about. Uh, the jobs, as Mr Wilson pointed out today, the jobs that in, uh, Invest Northern Ireland have been attracting, uh, the majority ha of those jobs have been well in excess of the, the medium wage in Northern Ireland, uh, and I think that is in itself a way in which we can uh, combat 
low pay within our economy by attracting in new jobs that are paying in excess of uh, the average wage. Um, I think that's something that we should be we should be continuing to pursue. I think that is a, a worthy goal within our economic strategy. It's not even a worthy goal. It's something actually that we have been achieving. Um, so I do want to see wages increase. I think that there is an obligation on employers uh, as the economy improves and they see their own positions as companies improve, that they pass the benefits of those improvements on to their staff. Uh, and I think that whilst you know, I can and other colleagues in this House can ream off a whole selection of statistics which show that our economy is growing, so economic growth is, is happening itself, the unemployment is going down, employment is going up, there's a whole, uh, property prices are rising, there's a whole range of indicators. The, the one place in which I don't think uh, economic recovery is being felt is in people's pockets. And that's why I think it's right that we keep household taxes low in Northern Ireland. But we've got to be mindful that that is caused by the fact that maybe their wages haven't been increasing, or particularly in the private sector, in many cases, their wages have gone down over the last number of years. So I do want to see as the economy grows, and I think all of us would want to see as the economy grows, that employers um, uplift their, the pay of their employees. Uh, I think that's something that we would all agree with. In terms of do, uh, conducting a study, um, I have nothing against conducting a study. I'm not entirely sure whether, given the nature of the subject, whether it's my department's responsibility or whether it might be the Department of Enterprise's responsibility to do something like that. Uh, certainly, it's something that I will consult with colleagues about. Thank the Minister for his answer. I'm just wondering, Minister, would you be willing to introduce a living wage condition as part of public procurement contracts? I think it was, this was a, a subject of, of a debate uh, some time ago in this House, and, I, and as far as I'm concerned, the issues haven't uh, radically changed around this issue. Um, again, we would, we would want our, um, the people who are uh, winning procurement contracts to be paying uh, people a, a, an appropriate wage who are working for them. The difficulty, in, in, I, think, I think there are, are, are a range of, of, of issues that we've got to be mindful of if, if we were to seek to enforce it as a government in all government contracts. Uh, the first is that it is likely that the successful contractor uh, will push the price on to us in terms of us being a customer, uh, and that we will see the price that we are paying for contracts go up as a result of increased costs. Um, and that will mean then ultimately, as that happens across the board, uh, that means ultimately that there will be less money in the public purse to spend on projects that benefit Northern Ireland. Uh, I think there's also an issue in terms of, of policing it, and how would we police it and ensure that they're doing it. Uh, and there will also be a situation where somebody in a firm is generally getting paid a, a wage that is uh, their normal wage is below the living wage, but for government contracts it would be on a living wage, and you could have a situation where three days of the week they're getting paid a living wage, and for two days of the week they're back down to say the national minimum wage. And you know I think there are, are issues and practical difficulties around all of that. So you know it's not something that I, I am pursuing as a policy. Uh, I would imagine that most of the contracts that we are letting people are being paid around or above the minimum wage anyway, uh, but I think there are practical concerns that we've got to bear in mind uh, if we were to head down that route. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, ask the Minister, does he agree that one of the most important ways to increase wages of people in our community is for the Executive to prioritise investment in the skills of our community? And can I ask him whether he thinks the 10 per cent reduction included in his most recent budget reflects that priority? Well, I, I think the, the whole House, I hope, uh, including the member and his party colleagues, recognise the very difficult financial circumstances that the executive finds herself in. Uh, and I think it would be incredibly difficult to, I mean, every, every area of public expending at times of budget becomes a priority. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm already starting to hear uh, representations from a wide range of groups saying that their area of funding should be uh, not just protected but increased. Uh, I very rarely get, uh, whenever those representations come forward, very rarely get any suggestions from those people as to where that money might be found, what other budget that money might be taken from, or what uh, source of revenue might be, be increased to, to, to bridge the gap. Um, I have said, and I think I said last Monday, that the uh, area of the budget settlement which I'm probably least satisfied with is actually the Department of Employment and Learning's settlement. Uh, there are reasons in terms of how the Minister put forward his bids and that they weren't inescapable bids which allowed me to meet them much easier than I might otherwise have been able to. Um, but I'm prepared to work with him uh, and I will be meeting with, meeting with him in the next number of weeks. I'm prepared to meet with others within the broad uh, university, college sector and others as well to 
see what we can in, in the difficult circumstances that we have. And let's bear in mind, you know, money is not just going to drop from the sky to the executive between draft and final stage that's going to allow us to give it all to universities or give it all to colleges as much as we might like it to be. But I am prepared to commit to working towards doing that. It is an area of the budget that I would like to see increased, uh, or certainly it's um, the impact of the cuts on it reduced. Uh, between draft and final budget, but that will be that will take considerable effort, and it will not be an easy task given the, the financial circumstances that we find ourselves in. In order that ends the period for listed questions, we now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Uh, Fi fiha million pont le chacht o commissionary califort vel firste ach near hanig and tarigachin higan aimanus. Boilum sa ifri denara katiga nar hanig shishin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And in case you think that was a Gregorian chant, it wasn't. Gregorian chant. I think uh, a Gregorian chant, uh, Gregorian chant is a, a form of liturgy which Adam's came into vogue during the reign of Pope Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if, I could, if I could ask the Minister, um, we were, at least the executive was, to receive £20 million from the Belfast Harbour Commissioners as part of this budget. We actually didn't receive that money. Can the minister explain why not? Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm glad that the, the member clarified that it wasn't a Gregorian chant because uh, you know that it, certainly I don't think our recording career awaits him uh, <laughs> if, if that was anything to go by. But the, 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 the member is right that the current budget that we're in, uh, the 11 to 15 budget, was predicated on releasing value. I think was the terminology that was used from the Port of Belfast. Uh, the Port of Belfast, one of our, our biggest. Uh, companies, one of our most profitable companies in Northern Ireland, and that there was a, a widespread view around the executive that there was value to be extracted from the port, because the port has done incredibly well, not just in its core business, which has grown, uh, that of being a port, but principally in the development of land in its ownership. Um, that, unfortunately, has not been, whilst, whilst I supported seeking to get that £20 million from the port, that hasn't been possible due to a range of legal difficulties. And I have to say I'm incredibly disappointed that the Department for Regional Development has not pursued that £20 million with the gusto that I would have expected it to. Um, it has, uh, and, and I think, and I wouldn't be alone in taking this view, that there was never really the seriousness within that department about pursuing that £20 million, and that's why we're in a situation now where we don't. And next year's budget, the 15-16 budget, I have had to restore that 20 million back into its baseline uh, because I don't think we had the, you know, it was feasible to continue without uh, putting that back into its baseline and, and, uh, and, and not dealing with the issue conclusively. Uh, because we had been obviously in monitoring rounds throughout the financial years, the last number of financial years, been allocating 20 million to it. Although we haven't agreed to do that this year because of the difficult circumstances that we are in in year. I call Mr. Bradley for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that comprehensive uh, answer. Would he agree with me that the Executive has been hoodwinked by the Harbour Commissioners, and would he now uh, give us an assurance that he will uh, make efforts to ensure? that we receive the 20 million due to us. Mr. Uh, I'm not sure whether I would, I would agree with the characterization of being hoodwinked. Um, I, I do, whilst next year's budget will not be predicated on releasing a value of 20 million from the port, uh, I don't think that we as an executive should give up on the pursuit of releasing value from the port. Uh, this is a public asset after all, uh, and whilst I'm not um, pleased with uh, the endeavours made by the Department for Regional Development. I'm not, I'm equally not pleased with the way the Harbour Commissioners have behaved in this respect either. Uh, they have uh, not been willing, in my view, to meet with the Executive and meet halfway even or compromise in some way or another. 
Uh, and it, this is a public asset. This is a publicly owned asset which is operated on our behalf by the Port of Belfast, by the Harbour Commissioners. Uh, I think where it is doing pretty well, and it is doing pretty well, and I commend the Harbour Commissioners for their stewardship of the Port of Belfast and the development land around it, um, I think it is only right and proper that it occasionally, not all the time, uh, government here in Stormont should seek to release value from it uh, on behalf which can be deployed elsewhere on behalf of our citizens. I think that is perfectly reasonable. I don't think that that should be met by legal threat or, or, or the threat of challenge, legal challenge by the port. I think they should be seeking to work with us uh, to release value from it on a, a one-off or on a, a short-term basis. So just because it's not in the um, draft budget doesn't mean that I certainly haven't given up on it. I, I hope that I'm not sure whether the same could be said for the Minister for Regional Development. I feel that uh, some time ago he gave up on this, uh, and as a result, we're, we're in, a, in a position where his department is £20 million worse off this year as a result. And I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Uh, thanks, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the ministers for his answers thus far? Uh, can the minister give us an update on the review and the commercial rates? The uh, review of non-domestic revaluation has uh, most of the field work uh, has concluded. There are some final bits and bobs of work going on in respect of all of that, and I would hope uh, that we will be able to publish in draft. Uh, the list of the new valuations for our 70 odd thousand non domestic properties across Northern Ireland uh, within a matter of weeks. I call Mr. Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister uh, for that update? Given that we've seen some fairly high profile closures in my own city, the, the closure of uh, Austin's, and thankfully it's been bought uh, from the receivers uh, this week, um, can the Minister tell us if this review? Uh, will do anything to prevent uh, major established businesses within my city and I'm sure within other towns and cities across the north uh, going out of business as a direct result uh, of uh, rates uh, issues? If I gave that there would be no major businesses anywhere in Northern Ireland, including in London Dairy, that wouldn't go out of business as a result of, of anything, um, you know, I can't make such a commitment and the member is uh, chancing his arm, Deputy Speaker, and asking me to do, do that. Um, look, I, I think that what, what we are trying to do with the revaluation is to re-establish fairness back into the non-domestic rating system. Uh, I had a, a, a very useful meeting. I hope it was a useful meeting with uh, his party colleague, Mr. Ramsey, and some traders from the City of Londonderry, uh, wherein I explained to them the, um, the history and the, uh, of, of uh, non-domestic rates and where we were moving towards and where I anticipated the results for uh, Londonderry to be and the city centre in Londonderry to be as a result of the non-domestic revaluation. And whilst I can't um, conclusively say now, and I wouldn't want to preempt the publication of the draft list um, by saying what I expect out of it, I do expect a rebalancing of uh, non-domestic rating values uh, across Northern Ireland and, and, and in towns and in cities like the members' own, where there has been a proliferation in the last number of years of, of large out-of-town and edge-of-town shopping centres uh, and retailers, uh, one would expect, I put it no stronger than that, one would expect to see that reflected in changes in non-domestic uh, valuations for those contained within a city centre or a town centre or streets or roads which haven't done perhaps as well over the last number of years. And you know, there will be um, some places that will do well out of the revaluation, some places that will do not so well out of the revaluation because they have held up, uh, and there are others that will be more or less unchanged. But you know, I think the, the attempt is to re-establish fairness, which has not, I accept, hasn't been there over the last number of years because we haven't been able to proceed with a non-domestic revaluation because the market was in such a state of flux uh, over the last number of years. And, and I hope that uh, businesses in the members' constituency and indeed in other constituencies welcome the results of the non-domestic revaluation when they're published. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashin. Uh, uh, could the Minister outline a strategy for sectoral engagement and for equality proofing of the draft budget? Gormagut? It's the same, same people getting drawn in, in both topicals and orals here. Um, the, um, the member will be aware that the draft budget is now out to an eight-week consultation. Um, I think the key uh, part of that 
eight weeks has, will be used by the departments themselves in establishing what their spending plans will be for the allocations that they now have within their budget. And they will outline where they want to spend money and where the savings that they are required to make within their budgets are going to be impacted upon. And there will be work for, for this House uh, and the committees in this House to do in terms of scrutinising that. Uh, and there will be engagement, I, I hope, taken on behalf of committees in this House with uh, interest groups uh, in each departmental uh, area of responsibility. Um, my department will engage in uh, sector by sector uh, stakeholder engagement meetings, so with the likes of trade unions and the business community and others who, uh, third sector, community sector, who would have a, a particular interest in the outcome of the, the budget. Uh, and that will be continuing over the next number of weeks. And, and um, obviously, screening will be done in terms of uh, the quality aspects of the budget uh, in accordance with the relevant legislation. Mr. Hushin for supplementary. Can the Minister then confirm that he also will be in contact with the likes of uh, the community and voluntary sector, women's groups, uh, disability groups and the LGBT community? Uh, I, I think it's important, um, given that it's an eight-week engagement uh, or an eight-week consultation, that we try to structure that engagement as best as we possibly can to ensure that we get best out of it in, in, in the run-up to the conclusion of the consultation on the 29th of, of December. So many of those groups that the member has talked about will, I think, certainly be either directly or, or indirectly represented at those stakeholder engagements. Uh, and I think that you know, we, we, it is out for general public consultation, and as we, we know from, from the past, that sometimes always doesn't get the uh, – it will get some responses, but it won't get a, a range of responses from um, – in a structured way and a focused way, so that's where I think stakeholder meetings are actually quite important and quite valuable. And uh, certainly, I'd be uh, more than happy to engage with. I, I'd not be able to engage personally with everybody uh, over that period of time, um, but I will be conducting bilaterals with each minister, uh, and I would expect them to reflect back to me um, the views expressed to them by various inter interest groups within their in their departments. So we will try to make it as thorough and comprehensive a consultation over the eight-week period as we possibly can. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister advise us on how the Infrastructure Action Plan is progressing? Deputy Speaker, the, the House may be familiar with the, my plan some time ago to uh, try to speed up uh, planning or uh, speed up planning as somebody else's responsibility, speed up the delivery of, uh, we could do with speeding up planning as well, of course, uh, speeding up the delivery of major infrastructure projects in Northern Ireland. And that, that, was, that flowed from some analysis that was undertaken which showed that we were significantly slower than other parts of the UK or Ireland in terms of delivering big infrastructure projects. Um, perhaps planning was the reason in many cases why they, they were slowed up. Um, so I, I developed a, an infrastructure action plan which focused on, focused on, on greater centralisation of infrastructure delivery. So the proposal was that for a range of uh, infrastructure projects that the delivery arm of that would be centralised in my own department. Um, that wasn't a, a power grab by me. It was about ensuring that there was a uniformity of delivery and that there were efficiencies in terms of, of cost savings uh, in delivering through one uh, service rather than through several services. There were some areas of infrastructure development which were, would remain outside of my department's responsibility in terms of delivery, but we were going to try to amalgamate as much as we possibly could, and, and we've already seen health estates move into my department from the, the 1st of October of this year. Uh, and there was also an attempt to try to prioritise big infrastructure projects. I think we've had a, a problem in the past, particularly with the likes of the A5 not moving forward in trying to then fast forward and fast track uh, major infrastructure projects to fill the breach. Uh, that, pro that plan has been circulated and has received support from uh, several ministers, the uh, Enterprise Minister, Social Development Minister, Justice Minister, Employment and Learning Minister. And I intend to take up uh, the issue with those ministers who have yet to respond. Uh, I always am optimistic and I take the fact that they haven't responded as not being negative about it. Uh, and I want to engage with them in the bilaterals that I will have with them on the budget over the, the next month. I want to engage with them on the infrastructure action plan so that we can get that endorsed by the whole executive as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister satisfied that the, the, the cuts will not hit his plan uh, dramatically? Well, it, the, I, I, it's a good question that the, the, the member raises in terms of the impact of, uh, of reductions in public spending on the delivery of infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure budget, our capital budget, is the one sort of brighter spot within our budget. The member will be familiar with 
the, uh, as well the whole house, the reduction uh, in our resource expenditure, so it's down 1.6 per cent in real terms. That has equated with the decisions that we have taken as an executive to a £213 million reduction in our, in our public spending for next financial year. The capital budget has been rising at a slightly above what uh, this current year's figure is, so um, I don't anticipate uh, funding per se to be a particular issue in terms of delivering infrastructure moving forward. And the investment fund that I alluded to in response to Mr Kinnahan earlier on gives us another vehicle by which we can continue to invest in, in infrastructure in Northern Ireland. So I don't imagine that a lack of funding will be the problem. I think it is probably more a lack of, uh, at this stage, a lack of broad political support for the action plan that will uh, not see it moving forward. Uh, but I do hope to iron out those problems, which I think are minor uh, with ministers over the next month or so. Thank you, Minister, and uh, that uh, is the end of question time.